Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Anat Achiron. I'm uh, the director of the Multiple Sclerosis Center in Sheba Medical Center, and I'm a neurologist by profession. Um, and it is uh, my privilege today to speak to you about the brain as a cognitive antigen. Um, this is my itinerary. First, we will start with self-recognition, and these are the main uh, issues I want to cover with you. So the lecture is a kind of a concept, um, and I put in my lecture some uh, references for you to read a little bit more later. So self-recognition, you know, is an important issue in the immune system, because if you are not recognizing <coughs> the relevant antigen, you are missing the whole process of immune response. But I would like to, rec to make the self-recognition of myself. So I come from Sheba. Sheba is a small city. Uh, I'm sure most of you know it. And here is the multiple cirrhosis center, um, which is uh, enlarged here. And this is our building. And um, the idea of the multiple cirrhosis center is to enable us to give comprehensive treatment to our patient. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. The center was established in 1995, and um, since then it has been enlarged very much. So today we have more than 4,000 patients that are at follow-up, and they come from all over Israel. The idea of the center is to give a comprehensive treatment uh, involving many aspects, not only neurologists, but also other, as other medical um, cons consultants like ophthalmologists, orthopedic surgeons, uh, urologists, psychiatrists, and also a large team of rehabilitation team, um, including nurses, physiotherapists as well, uh, to be able to give uh, the whole spectrum of needs to our patients. Um, and in addition, we are very much involved in many research projects related to the various aspects of the disease like epidemiology, cognition, image analysis, neuroimmunology, gene expression, rehabilitation, education, and I hope that some of you will visit our center and get the direct impression. So let's start uh, about the immune system. I just want to mention that if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to disrupt me, and I would prefer that the lecture will be a kind of a mutual talk. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, related, I, I was told by Uri that uh, most of you have different uh, backgrounds. So I'm not sure, I was not sure about your knowledge in relation to immunology. So I decided to give some few slides on basic definition. So first of all, we have to consider the innate immune response, which is the rapid response to any um, immune pathogen and um, we or the immune system can detect the pathogen which are defined as uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns uh, that are characteristic structures present by microorganism and these are recognized by the immune receptors we have two important family the toll receptors and uh, the NOD protein uh, family of of receptors that enable the innate immune system to actually recognize foreign antigens. This innate uh, immune system activates in vertebrates the more sophisticated adaptive immune system, which includes T cell and B cells. And uh, actually, uh, the two, both systems can enable us to respond um, correctly to different um, intruders. So first we have the antigen presenting cells like macrophages that are activated through the pathogen. Uh, and as I mentioned by uh, activating the toll, the toll receptors, uh, this activation leads to production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. We can measure these cytokines in the blood of patients and can identify whether we have a pro-inflammatory immune response. Uh, but thereafter the antigen are presented through the MHC uh, molecules to further uh, antigen presenting cell and T lymphocytes um, and this activation will uh, actually results in effector T cells which will terminate the immune response and I'll show you here 
will be uh, more easier for you uh, to see. So we have a, a pathogen, let's say a virus or a um, bacteria, and these are activating the TOLA receptors. This will result in cytokine production and then activation of vector T cells to induce uh, the innate immune response. In the same time, the uh, pathogen will be activated through MHC and T cell receptors of naive T cells, again, to enhance T cell effector response. And what are the differences between the two systems? Uh, this is a short summary that the innate immunity is actually the early, the very active response that occurs within hours from the invasion of, let's say, pathogen, where the adaptive immunity takes time. So it will last or will appear after a few days. There are different cell types involved in the early phase, the macrophages, the dendritic cell and neutrophils, and in the adaptive immunity, B and T lymphocytes, and there are different receptors. Um, and the recognition of various antigen is conserved. So the innate immune response is able to, um, to respond in a kind of limited way while there is a, anyone knows what is this number? How many, how many zeros we have here? So we have 18 zeros and it's, uh, the name is Quintilon, which is uh, like very, very enlarged number. So this is uh, to tell you that there is a really um, unlimited option for the immune system to respond. And when we look at the brain in a similar way, our brain is able also to respond to different stimuli. So this is uh, the typical homunculus, and the homunculus was um, um, actually uh, shown in many studies uh, many, many years ago, more than 200 years ago, and you can see the whole body represented here. This is the motor homunculus, and this is the sensory homunculus, suggesting that uh, each, uh, uh, each part of our body is represented in the cortex, Okay, so if we stimulate this area, we can stimulate the hand, and if we stimulate this area, we can stimulate the sensory feeling in the face. Um, and this is important because it's like a stimulation of an antigen, and it is very specific. Moreover, there is an input, there is a process, and there is an output. And the idea is, for instance, when you uh, touch uh, something that is very hot, okay, uh, just imagine how much time it takes to your hand to get away. Any idea? Like a few milliseconds, so it's very fast. This is like the innate immune response because the brain is very capable to respond immediately and the whole process, uh, and this will be my task today to show you how, how this process is very, very fast. So when we look at this picture, you can see that we have a non-specific uh, antigenic recognition. You see all these people, um, and you don't know to whom I intend to talk about. So I'll show you. Here you see anyone that I'm referring to? Not yet, maybe here. I'm enlarging the picture. I want you to find my antigen. To, can you recognize her? Okay, so you can see her in the smaller picture. And this is uh, just to wake you up because some of you are still <laughs> sleeping. And uh, this uh, beautiful uh, model is a very known antigen. And, uh, <laughs> and when we look at the brain and we um, have various visual facial antigen recognition, do you know where in the brain this process is occurring? So this is very specific. And the area where we can recognize faces is the fusiform gyrus, okay, which is located in the area of the occipital cortex here. And is responsible for facial recognition. I uh, visited New York a uh, few months ago, not few months, a month ago. And uh, in the middle of Times Square, I saw this sign. And immediately it was something that uh, I knew is uh, calling me because uh, this you can see there, are, there was a, 
a recognition, but I could not identify the faces or the people behind the face. Why is that? Why I could not recognize it? Um, and the idea is that our brain has a specific HLA which is uses pattern recognition. All of us know to identify faces because the faces are built in a specific patterns that we learned to recognize. This is a study that was reported about a decade ago showing how object recognition is performed. So you can see here there are, are common points, okay? And these are a common face. So there is no way that if I put to uh, the people that participated in the study to recognize, they would identify the dots and the face. But when the face is disrupted, we lost the pattern, there is more difficulty to identify. It. Similarly, if you can see here, this you immediately can identify as the same face and it takes more time to, uh, to understand that this is a different face. And of course, if you put a clutter within uh, the middle of the picture, again, there is uh, more difficulty for you to identify the, uh, the antigen. Another study that was made by a Japanese group, uh, again, they took students and they asked the students to identify face-like objects. And you can see that these are very s nicely um, described face. Maybe the eyes are a little bit different, but anyone can recognize the face. It took the participant 300 milliseconds more to identify the non-face-like object. Why is that? Because again, the brain is, no to re is known to recognize the uh, pattern recognition which he has learned for. And you can see here, again, how we can use this long-term recognition to understand plasticity. You can see here this uh, pattern, okay? Everybody can identify the pattern which are depicted in white on a blue pattern. What about here? Can you see the pattern? Yes. Is it more difficult for you to identify them? And you can see that the only change is just the, the change in uh, the color. Um, and when, uh, again, participants were asked to identify, you can see what happened. Pre-training, there was um, the percent correct was similar between trained and untrained. However, after some period of training, you can see that the trainee did much better than those that did not train. So what we can see that there is a process of brain learning when we can improve the response uh, to different stimuli. And uh, this is taken from uh, the work published by Professor Yarun Cohen from the Weizmann Institute, which uh, I think is one of the world-known immunologists uh, for um, many, many years and really um, established a new concept in immunology. And uh, he also uh, compared the immune system into um, the cognitive system. And you can see how he depicted the process. We have uh, different antigen, infection, trauma, neoplasia, uh, and this actually activates the innate or the adaptive immune system and actually results in immune response. Of course, inflammation, but also apoptosis, angiogenesis, proliferation, migration, <coughs> etc. And there is always a feedback. Why do you think feedback is important? Feedback is very important because the immune system has to stop the process of inflammation. If we don't stop the process and the inflammation is continuing, okay, like we will see in autoimmune diseases, then we have a permanent uh, damage that cannot be um, easily corrected. So there is a, a process of feedback regulation whereby the immune system is told to stop the inflammatory response and there is also a self-organization process whereby the immune system will produce memory cells, sp specifically T cells, uh, and these memory cells will enable the immune system uh, so the next time the same infection or a, a similar infection will occur, we already will be prepared. So we have either memory T cells or we have already antibodies produced by B cells that can help us um, to eradicate the inv uh, invasion, invasive pathogen very uh, quickly. 
And of course, if this process is interrupted, so if the immune system fails to recognize these pathogens, what do you think will be? We'll have a real problem, we'll talk about it in a minute, and one of the processes I want to talk to you um, about is the autoimmune diseases that are the result of impaired recognition. And this is also taken from Professor Cohen's uh, paper showing how the homunculus actually is very similar to the immune system and again you get a stimuli, you get a response and then you reorganize uh, the responses. So how the process of protection in the brain is uh, actually <coughs> operating? The central nerve system is ex continuously med uh, monitored by resident microglia. These microglia are um, within the brain since the day we are born. And in addition, we have immune cells that are transferred into the brain through the blood-brain barrier, like macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, that are aimed to detect the damaging agent that would disrupt the homeostasis and the functioning of the normal brain. So, as we already mentioned, uh, the CNS must balance between detection of this harmful factor uh, and the possibility to resolve the immunological response in a way that it will not uh, damage the tissue itself. And what do you think the brain can do for brain protection? So, one of the surprising things is that the brain has no lymphatic vessels. So if the brain has no lymphatic vessels, how it protects itself? <coughs> and uh, I want to talk a little bit about this issue. We have the interstitial fluid of the central nerve system that drains via perivascular channels into the cerebrospinal fluid. And this allows meningeal macrophages and, uh, and other antigen-presenting cells to move into the subarachnoid space and to actually get uh, the knowledge, the full range of different central nerve system antigen. Um, this an antigen can also be transported through the, ter through the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, uh, going into the nasal mucosa and getting into the cervical lymph node. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have the cerebrospinal fluid as a functional equivalent of lymphatics. And just to show you this in a cartoon, uh, you can see here uh, that the brain is actually evolved and uh, within the cerebrospinal fluid, which is produced here in um, the subarachnoid space, uh, and it's produced um, through the arachnoid villi. Uh, it is also within the ventricle where the choroid plexus can produce uh, cerebrospinal fluid and is generated here going into the uh, uh, spinal cord. Um, and as I mentioned, it can go here through the uh, nasal mucosa into the afferent lymphatic. Um, and uh, this CSF has various uh, importance. You can see here uh, in this um, short uh, video, the pulsating CSF. So there is always a con con constant movement of the CSF. And now we are trying uh, using a brain MRI even to measure the velocity of the cerebrospinal fluid uh, around the brain and to see whether it is um, different in various diseases. And the volume of the CSF is 100 to 2070. There is a daily pro production of about half a liter of cerebrospinal fluid. And there is a turnover between three to four, five times uh, per day. And most of the cellular pattern of the CSF includes T cells. There is also a small number of B cells, monocytes, and dendritic cells. So do you think that the brain is immune privileged area? Yes, you think so. And what makes you think so? It is demonstrated, many studies have tried to place uh, different materials like tumor cells, like viruses, like bacteria directly on the brain tissue. And in spite of that, if we, these studies avoided of course the ventricles and the meninges, so the CSF was not involved, there was no tissue disruption. 
So there is a physical barrier that does not enable these different uh, immunological material to enter the brain. Uh, and this was suggest that there is something that prevents them to enter. And this, of course, is the very famous blood-brain barrier, okay, which is uh, important because the blood-brain barrier um, prevents um, all these pathogens or all these various materials to enter the brain. And the blood-brain barrier is an in intercellular tight junction that um, you can see here, okay, you can see um, the pia mater, you can see the subarachnoid space, and then um, you can see here enlargement of this area where you can see that there is a cerebrovascular endothelial cells and endothelial basement membrane, and here is the brain parenchyma. And I'll show you in uh, uh, the next slide how this occurs, but I just want to mention that, that we have the neurovascular coupling so there is ability of the central nerve system micro vessels to respond to increased neuronal activity by enhancing the blood flow within the area of the brain. And this, of course, will occur much um, in a higher rate uh, when we have inflammation. Um, and this and embedded endothelial cells, uh, which are within the endothelial basement membrane, are very important to the barrier. We have the similar barrier also between the CSF and the choroid plexus. We have a similar barrier within our eyes, okay? So this uh, process of a um, barrier is very important. And if we want, for instance, that some drugs will enter the brain, what should we do? One of the idea is to disrupt the blood brain barrier, to open it, and therefore many drugs that could not enter, for instance, the brain, would be important. Um, or vice versa. If we have a disease which has, um, like multiple sclerosis, and we don't want the immune cells to enter to the brain, into the brain, we can actually enhance the uh, blood-brain barrier in order that it will be so close, nobody will enter. So just to show you, again, the narrow anatomy of the vascular blood-brain barrier, and you can see in this area of the capillary, okay, the vascular segment of the capillary, there is a tight junction whereby there is no uh, ability to distinguish between the parenchymal basement membrane, okay, and the endothelial basement membrane. They are actually one, and only in the post-capillary venules you can see uh, that there is a separation between the endothelial basement membrane and the parenchymal basement membrane, and you can see the cerebrospinal fluid in between. And this is very important because, again, as I suggested, this tight junction is important as a guardian. But, as I said, there are also a possibility of the immune cells to enter the brain. So how T cells will enter the brain? If there is a, such a tight junction, there is a problem for, a, for the immune system to enter the brain. And this is uh, just, uh, again, to show you there are five steps, at least five steps. And this is the T-cells. The T-cells is moving very fast within the blood, okay, and it has to enter the brain. He is like a gatekeeper. He wants to enter, get in, get out, to see what's going on. If there is a problem, these T-cells have to respond. So first, there are several uh, receptors here on the endothel that will stop the, the rolling and will uh, make the T cells to be slower, then they will activate it. And you can see um, receptors like for, uh, alpha 4, beta 1, like VCAM 1, LEF, LEA 1, and ICAM 1. And this receptor will uh, induce the process of crawling. And you can see how the T cells actually tries to send a kind of a leg from the cell uh, body and to enter this very tight junction into uh, the brain parenchyma. So to, um, to suggest that uh, in addition to uh, the T cells, we have various immune cells in the CNS. Uh, we have the parenchymal microglia, which actually are belonging to the innate immune system, and there are habitants of the brain and the rise from the yolk sac, okay, when the embryos produ 
was uh, developing, and they are maintained by local uh, proliferative capacities uh, and uh, actually um, are uh, uh, habitants of the brain tissue. In addition, you can see all this list of various immune cells, either produced within the choroid plexus, uh, within the meninges, or coming from the peripheral blood. And all these um, soldiers, okay, let's call them soldiers of the brain, uh, are uh, aimed to prevent the, uh, or, or to protect the brain. And just to show you, this is um, taken from a study uh, that was published recently, a very nice work by Wu and colleagues, and they showed here, you can see here a pyramidal axon in red, and around this axon you can see a microglia. When the axon has a, a, a baseline a activity, you can see this, um, let's say, these arms of the, of the microglia around, but when there is increased electrical activity of the axon, you can see also the response of the microglia by additional arms going around the axon. So there is all the time a contact uh, activation uh, and response uh, between the immune cells and the brain parenchyma, and this interaction are um, enabling the uh, better surveillance for uh, if any problem occurs. <coughs> so just to, um, to summarize this, uh, this uh, um, part of the lecture is that although the central nerve system lacks lymphatics and uh, displays low level of MHC molecules and also of course as we discussed is shielded by the blood brain barrier and the blood CSF barrier, the immune response in the brain can be impressive. So at time of need, like for instance, if we had a meningitis uh, um, or encephalitis, you, we can see a huge immune response within the brain. Uh, and of course, by contrast, when we lose uh, the possibility of immunity because of many reasons, um, and I'll show you one of them, uh, in different infection, Again, um, there is a significant problem. Quite a slide that you before. So, was it the activity changing the activation <coughs> state of the microglia or just the, the, the shape and the processes? So, the idea was that when, when they did uh, the study, they uh, demonstrated that increased electrical activity will increase the microglial surrounding the axons. So um, one of the interpretation would be that when you have an axon uh, that is more active um, and there is a kind of inflammatory response around the axon, this how it will be uh, presented. So when there, is in, when, when there is an inflammation in the brain, actually the, infl the inflammatory response is in the cells. And we need... Inflammation is one thing and activity is something which occurs all the time. Yes, but during inflammation, there will be increased activity. That's what they, they wanted to show, that there is an, a constant, let's say, uh, mutual, mutual uh, response and result, in a way. So, some words about a very uh, fatal disease, progressive multifocal encephalopathy. Any one of you heard about it, this disease? Uh, so this is a usually fatal CNS infection called by a specific virus, which is JC virus. And the name of JC is John Cummings. So this was the first patient that died from this disease and was diagnosed. There are no treatments for PML. And most patients either die or left with severe neurological disability. Uh, about 50% of humans have JCV uh, Lately, latently in the bone marrow or the renal tubular epithelial cells and also in their B cells. So about 50% of you will have this uh, JC virus um, currently and therefore are at a risk for to develop PML. Fortunately, uh, not everybody will develop PML. And why is that? Because we have a very good immune system that prevent the virus to enter the brain. And when the virus enter, enters the brain, 
you can see this is a significant demyelination, okay, and this is seen by uh, brain MRI, you can see the eyes, this is an axial section, this is the nose, and you can see all this area, all this temporal parietal area uh, is affected by the virus, and this is a post-mortem um, slice, again showing disruption of the brain tissue due to the virus. Um, you can see here um, in histology how the cortex is um, disrupted and there is no myelin. And the problem why PML actually occurs. Any ideas? Immune suppression. Immune suppression. So when we have immune suppression, um, so we lose our CD4 or CD8 T cells, so we use the adaptive immune system Mm, let's say um, protective processes, then the virus can get happy and party and enter the brain and um, cause the disease. And this occurs especially in patients with HIV, uh, in patients receiving chemotherapy or uh, immuno immunotherapy, it enters the brain and um, kills the oligodendrocytes that are the cells that produce myelin. Uh, a new, a new group of PML occurred in the last years, and uh, this occurred when the researcher uh, actually identified new molecules that the aim of these molecules was to prevent lymphocytes to enter the CNS. And the idea was if we prevent these lymphocytes to enter the CNS, we will not have diseases like multiple sclerosis like lymphoma uh, that can enter the brain. And these drugs that are against the blood-bound barrier, like natalizumab, like eflizumab, rituximab, actually caused, the treatment itself caused uh, PML because patients, again, were immune suppressed in a way and the, the drug itself induced lack of surveillance by the immune system and resulted in uh, invasion of the JC virus from the peripheral blood into the brain. Just want to show you a study that uh, we have um, uh, completed uh, last, uh, last year and in our patient we treated them with natalizumab with a very efficient drug for the treatment of multiple sclerosis However, as I said, this drug can switch people that were JC virus negative to become positive. And we saw that there is a very high percentage, about 25% of anti-JCV antibody negative patients that become positive. And um, you can see when we did the gene expression dendrogram, you can see here in green all the patients that were switchers as compared to uh, to the black one, were, which were not switchers. And we wanted to see what is the different gene expression signature. And you can see here very nicely that the gene expression picture, the signature is different. You can see most of the genes here are in blue and here are in red, suggesting, suggesting that the expression was different. And when we looked what are these uh, genes, we can see that in JCV switchers, the, the main signature was enriched by overexpression of genes associated with invasion of uh, uh, the virus into uh, the, the host cell. And uh, this is um, a, a process that occurs in many patients whereby um, the, the treatment that we give them actually uh, made them in a risk because now the uh, virus can more easily enter into the brain. And this is how it looks. The, uh, you can see here an oligodendrocyte, which is enlarged by viral particles. You can see here a huge astrocyte, which is reactive in, due to the uh, viral infection. And you can see here in electron microscopy the JCV particles in an oligodendrocyte nucleus. So this is um, a a process whereby we can see how the immune system failed to respond uh, correctly. And uh, moving to the most interesting part of my talk. What is the reason that the uh, <laughs> immune system outside the, the brain does not uh, deal with this virus? Uh, 
Um, outside the brain, you mean that um, maybe it deals, but not good enough, uh, because what we see is that the virus has a predilection into the brain. So uh, the B cells, when they enter into the brain, the virus itself um, does not do anything to all 50% of us that has it when it has in, in our body and, and we have a normal immune system. So just a latent virus is okay. The problem is when it is able to enter the brain. So one of the question is, why is that? So the process of protection needs to be within the brain. Or because, because, because when the BBB is okay, okay, uh, and, and T cell and B cells, probably the virus also enter the brains, but it doesn't activate anything because it is terminated. Or, or okay. Yes? <coughs> if BBB disruption is enough for it to get into the brain or you have to be immunosuppressed and BBB disruption? Or um, just immunosuppressed? No BBB immunosuppressed is not enough because not everybody that ha is immunosuppressed will have the, the infection. So it is much more than being immunosuppressed. You also have to have disrupted BBB, for instance. Um, like, for instance, in, in inflammatory responses in the brain, yes. 